Today, we're going to talk a lot about food. And I think given the time that it is, we're all going to be hungry by the end of it. But today, we're going to be speaking about the history and the origin of Indian food. We've got with us Sonal Vaid. She's the content director at India Food Network, Taste Made India. She's the food editor at Vogue. And if you, like me, read HT Brunch religiously, you've probably seen her there too. So we're going to talk today about her new book, Whose Samosa Is It Anyway? We'll play a fun quiz and we'll see and test your knowledge of a lot of foods and where they've come from. We're going to learn some idiosyncratic facts, and I had to really practice that word, about food. And we're going to get some tips on making quick food because that is something that we all struggle with. Sonal is a Mumbai-based cookbook author. She's a cookery show host and a journalist with over 12 years of experience with newspapers, digital media, and magazines. She wrote Tiffin, which is her second book, which celebrates the diversity of India's regional cuisine. It was listed in Savoir magazine, Vogue India, Bon Appetit, and the New York Times as the must-have cookbook for 2018. So welcome, Sonal. We're excited to have you here. I am super excited to be doing this. Like I said, this is the first time I'm doing something like an online live thing. So this is going to be exciting. So Sonal, I think the first question, and probably everybody asks you about this, you're a cookbook author, but you really delved into the history of Indian food. Why did you want to do that? Uh, when I wrote my book, Tiffin, um, that is when I thought that, you know, just writing recipes is not going to be enough. There are certain layers of Indian food that I kind of have to unravel because I was so curious myself um, and that's what began my journey to talk up to find out the history of Indian food where it comes from why is it that tomato was not here from the prehistoric times and is a very recent thing why is it that we drink chai so much and where does jalebi come from these are just things I was curious about and that's what led to this book and your cooking and your recipes are very, very different. So tell us a little bit about that before I turn it over to you. And we're very excited because we're going to get this presentation that is it's really kind yeah. of very, very modern. So I think, um, you know, I don't think my recipes are different. What I'm trying to do, Supriti, really is to kind of uh, dig that second layer of Indian food. So when I say first layer, I think it's the butter chicken, it's the jalebi. When I say the second layer, it's uh, ki keys. Uh, it is the Gujarati handvo. It is just the second layer that is often ignored. Um, it's there. It's very much part of somebody's home if they are from region, but find it on a restaurant menu. So I try to kind of pick that up and talk more about it because I don't want it to get lost. I feel very territorial, very close to Indian food. And I want to be able to talk about it as much as I can. So with that, Sonal, I'm going to turn it over to you because we're excited to learn about Indian food. Yes, thank you. Um, can I start my presentation? Please do. A little bit, I'll just tell you a little bit before I start this is um, that, you know, this is something that I presented at my book launch. Um, what we tried to do is we tried to create an edible adaptation of the book. The book takes you through various chapters of Indian history. Uh, and talks about food through them. For example, what did people eat in the Indus Valley? What happened when religious texts like the Vedas came into um, India? Uh, basically, when people began to eat in a certain way and why they did. So each chapter takes you through different parts of history. And we, we encapsulated that in six to seven dishes. And that's what I'm going to be talking about through this presentation. Very nice. And uh, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. So please start. Okay. So the first thing um, is now Earth's mass. Okay, here's, a, here's what I like to compare Earth's mass with. It was like a couple who was constantly breaking up and patching up, just like Jen and Ben. It all starts with Rodinia, which is a supercontinent that existed at least 750 million years ago uh, when all of Earth's land mass was one. Then this is what it looked like, basically. Then around 175 million years ago, a break um, led to Pangaea, which was like a supercontinent, splitting into two larger continents. One of them was Laurasia, which was North America, Europe, Asia, and Gondwana. Um, sorry, it was uh, North America, Europe, and Asia. And the other one was Gondwana. Now, Gondwana comprised of Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, and India. And the Central Asian Gond tribe gets his name from this very word, which is Gondwana. And now it, it was separated. Uh, are we clear till here? Yeah. 
So this is what it started off as. This is what it became 150 million years ago. Yeah, 175 million years ago, approximately. And whoever has questions, they can kind of put it in the chat and then we can tackle that later. Uh, so this is what it looked like. Like the all of Earth's landmass was one, then it split up into different countries and then it, India became what India is today in, in terms of how it looks on the map. Um, how is all this relevant to the food of India? Um, this is just to say that even before India became the country uh, that it is today, a lot of geological changes were taking place on Earth. Now, these geological changes have been taking place for centuries and they're going to continue to take place in the years to come. So this brings me to my very first question. The question I started asking myself when I began writing this book is what is authentically Indian to even begin with? I mean, even the land mass is not authentically Indian to begin with. It was something else before India became the India that is. So this is the first question. What is even Indian food? Now, I love to hear that. people's answers to that too. What they think is what is Indian food? I think, I think, uh, I think uh, if they have questions, they can put it on the chat. I'm happy to kind of take it, them, take them together. Is that cool? Perfect. Yes, perfect, perfect. Okay. And I mean, if you can always stop me and ask me, I'm happy to Oh yeah, Indian food is all about spice. Yeah, that is true. Indian food is all about spice, uh, but there is a lot more. And I think we will get to that as we begin talking more and more. Um, now, I started my journey um, to talk about Indian food in the Indus Valley. Um, why Indus Valley? Because it was first kind of like a formal civilization that laid base uh, in India. You will have to make do with this visual. It's technically an American sitcom of Flintstones, but I couldn't find Indian, Indian Indus Valley people looking this glamorous. So we, we are going to stick to this, okay? Um, who are early Indians? Before we understand food, we have to understand who are Indians. Around 6000 BC, the Indian subcontinent mainly consisted of three kinds of people. The first were the South Asian hunters and gatherers who were the oldest inhabitants of the subcontinent. The second were the Iranian agriculturists. Possibly, they brought with them certain forms of wheat, pulses and barley when they came to this part of the Indus Valley from Iran. And lastly, one migration happened from by the steppe pastoralists. Now, these are people from the Volga and Don River Valley, um, which is in Russia. And loosely, people call them as Aryans. So there's a whole theory about how Aryans came and kind of uh, invaded India and all of that. Um, I feel like those are stories. Uh, this was just a migration that happened at that point of time on the Indus Valley. The next is agriculture. Now, one of the earliest documented experiments in agriculture can be found in a village at the foot of Bolan Pass. Now, Bolan Pass is, oh yeah, someone's, Amar is saying Aryan, Persian, Dravidian. Yeah, perhaps. Um, one of the earliest documented experiments in agriculture can be found in a village at the foot of the Bolan Pass, which is in current day Balochistan, and it was called Mehergar. Um, here we found seeds of emma and einkorn wheat and barley, which makes me kind of conclude that these are indigenous Indian crops. And we also found domesticated animal bones of sheep, goat, water buffalo, zebu cattle. In fact, buffalo and zebu cattle are one of the largest founded remains on the site. Now, how did Indus Valley come about? This, these are the people. This is who Indians were. Now, how did the valley come about? The Indus Valley is four of the most important civilizations in the world. The others are Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and the Yellow River civilization of China. These were the ones that were, that set their base in the like early, early, early times. Now, the first village that came in India was called Mehergar, and that was kind of the precursor to the larger Indus Valley that was going to come about. Small villages of Mehergar started to be abandoned and la and became the larger cities and the larger Indus cities. So if you studied this in geography, probably you will know, uh, you know, how Indus Valley was so ahead of its time. It was super civic. Uh, they had a great drainage system. They had great agricultural practices in place. All of that is true. And because they were so savvy through their remains, we are able to tell so much about how those guys lived. Lastly, obviously, if there were people, they ate something, right? They didn't, they didn't live hungry. They were not just hunters and gatherers. They had a proper agricultural system in place, which helped me start off to understand 
what the heck is indian food because this is where it starts um while the book in depth will discuss the ingredient uh, ingredients and remains found on the indus valley as a part of this experiment i have taken a research which was conducted by anurima kashyap and steve weber in 2010 these are two scientists one of them now works with google they are not archaeologists anymore uh, they conducted a starch analysis of the molecules gathered from the utensils and tools found on excavation sites like you know they they they, they researched on the dental enamel of animals and humans from those sites especially one site called farmana just to piece together what what did those people eat at that time and they came up with a recipe called the proto curry proto curry so this is the first food kind of like the first curry this is the this is where it all starts this is the they pieced it together so they found a little bit of aubergine they found a little bit of turmeric they found ginger they put it all together to create this first ever curry uh, and this is what it looked like we conducted we we i got a chef uh, in bombay to make this out of the recipe that anurima and steve have put it together and this is what the curry looked like it's very basic um you know i don't even know whether this what kind of salt did they salt their food or what but uh, there was uh, uh, salt pans which were found in one of the regions of uh the indus valley which kind of make me makes me conclude that perhaps they had salt and they salted their food as well this is what it looks like looks like um now shall we move on to the next chapter does anybody want to me ask me anything about this one any questions no i think people are just digesting i think this is the one that's going to have the most impact because religion and food is so intertwined <laughs> so uh this is one of my most interesting and exciting chapters i was very excited to be researching the influence of religion that has on our food because it ha it's it's there even today right there's so much of religion that impacts our food choices from the way we fast to the things that we eat and don't eat because religious customs tell tell us to do that i think this was interesting to understand how it all started from early back in the days so this brings me to the next chapter of how indian food was influenced by religion i'm going to touch upon a few points i came across while writing this one and i'm dividing indian food references into three major religions in india of course there were several others um but these are the bigger ones that impacted indian food firstly vegetables like potato carrot radish were not mentioned uh in jain scriptures at all right today what do we understand jains don't eat potato they don't eat gal a uh, garlic they don't eat carrot they don't eat radish but some of these are not even mentioned in earlier jain scriptures um in agams which are basically jain religious texts i found ingredients like hirila sirila sheer vidadri peluti podwal shewal which may have become extinct over time and some recognizable foods include ginger garlic honey figs sugarcane neem uh milk curd jaggery oil ghee confirming that these are all indigenously indian ingredients and they haven't traveled from anywhere at least during that time the next now there's very buddhism now there's very little information about what buddha ate but he certainly did not eat this what you're seeing on your screen this is what we understand right of the fancy buddha bowl everyone talks about the buddha bowl now where did that come from where, how why why are we eating the buddha bowl right now where there's a very interesting connection to what is there in buddhist scriptures and this bowl this fancy modern bowl that you will get across uh restaurants in new york and even la uh people are succumb all in indian food influencers or food influencers across the world are instagramming this and it it's amazing how it has its roots right back in the days now research from this from the, the time of buddha brings out an interesting fact as prince gotama he ate high quality meals because he was a prince and he lived in a palace he ate long grain rice which i would like would be an equivalent to a basmati but like even more richer he ate barley cakes because barley was an indigenous indian ingredient ghee curd butter a variety of meats including beef goat fowl venison fresh water fish pork and even liquor but once he was on the path to enlightenment buddha gave up all of that and he moved to things like the indian uh, fruit jujube sesame cake and one grain of rice at times because he was going towards abstinence so he would survive on one grain of rice now contrary to popular belief some schools of buddhism even today will allow meat 
only if the monk was certain that the meat was not cut for him it was pre cut and it is just being served to him the rule was simple you can eat something as long as it is put in your bowl which is where this whole buddha bowl comes into picture because the whole concept is for random things to be put together and then you eat it as a meal right it comes from that thought process of buddhism you eat what is put in your bowl any questions so far i think amar is saying ancient indians were also non vegetarian yeah so yeah pretty much the fact that we found uh, the fact that we found so many of uh, re animal remains right on in the site itself proves that obviously they ate it not all of them were domesticated so you are absolutely right uh, amar monks used to get food uh, arms in a bowl yeah that's correct amar absolutely right and okay. they would eat whatever was given in the bowl so absolutely. it wasn't absolutely now lastly uh, we are going to be talking about uh, hinduism um this is a very interesting book that i found um called pakadarpanam by nala now i've gone through various hindu scriptures ranging from translations of mahabharat ramayan vedas and found a whole bunch of ingredients for which you'll have to read my whole book of course so i'm not going to tell you much mm -hmm. but for the sake of this presentation i'm going to focus on one dish called supa now i found supa something uh, in king nala's cookbook story is told in mahabharat according to me he was one of the first indian male chefs one of the first indian male chefs because even bhima was known to cook or like have this thing about food um this book is called pakadarpanam this is the english translation of this book and the dish i found here was called supa uh, you will see the picture in the fourth in the, in the next slides um this dish was made with a combination of legumes minimal flavoring and as nala says back in those times garnish it with edible ingredients uh, in edible flowers now this is something that chefs will do in modern restaurants where they will garnish food with edible flowers but nala said it back in the days zillions of years ago during the time of mahabharat when he, i mean when this book was compiled garnish this food with edible flowers so just tells us how ahead of his time he was he not only spoke about recipes he also told people how to present food he he was a king but he was so interested in cuisine that he spoke about how to garnish food how to lay out food how to serve your guests and all of that any questions here so far because i'm moving to the next chapter we don't see any questions i think we can move on okay now the other one is indian royalty my chapter on indian royalty talks about indian food influences mentioned in literatures from the periods of the period of the nandas mauryas pallavas cholas vijayanagar empire and i found a whole lot of food influences in all these books and text uh, texts from these periods um one of the most interesting ones was manosolasa a sanskrit text written by king someshwar deva someshwar deva and some of it reveals the food habits of the chalukya empire now i'll give you a fun fact uh, and then i just go back to the previous slide so i don't know if you got that but what i'm trying to say is there was no mirchi during the mughal time what we eat as current mughlai food from the mughal period has so much of mirchi and cream and tomato it didn't exist at that time so this is what i'm trying to say here okay and now we can go to the next one now talking about chalukya empire now you see the little kaluchari uh, dynasty on right on top of ananya is pointing that out uh, above the chalukya empire right this is where bahubali comes from the movie this is where it originates from the the, the kaluchari dynasty a little below that is chalukya empire a lot of food influences came from uh, king someshwar deva's manosolasa um and what we are going to and what we are going to be talking now is a dish which i think was where dahi vada comes from now everybody says chaat came from the mughal empire and you know it was designed there and all of that but dahi vada existed before they happened to india <coughs> and in in manosolasa king someshwar deva talks about something called the vatika vatika was basically exactly like made with urad dal paste it was deep fried it was served with something called buttermilk which is just like dahi right 
so uh, this existed back in the days and this is what it looked like it was further garnished with a slice he said garnish it with slices of ginger so it was flavored with pepper and then it was uh, garnished with little, little slivers of ginger this is the original recipe that again uh, the chefs have replicated now this is where the name of my book comes from uh, from the later empires of india indian food was greatly impacted by the marathas the sindhyas the rajputs and several other kingdoms but nobody changed the face of indian food like the central asian invasions um this is an illustration of early illustration from a book called nimmat nama and you can see the samosa being uh, prepared uh this is a version of something fried being prepared and served uh and this is roughly what it may have looked like this is also the period where we got dishes like jalebi faluda biryani gulab jamun naan pulao and so many other dishes which we so casually say are indian right we just so casually feel jalebi is indian naan is indian um but it was a central asian invasion that got these dishes to india which brings me to the title of my book whose samosa is it anyway um anna can we move on to the next slide this is what i wrote in my book about samosas um i'll just read it out to you for me it was an appropriate dish after which to title my book the seemingly indian dish has translated far and wide before it became a mainstay in our gullies the first mention of samosas can be found around the 10th or the 11th century in the middle east in historian abdul fazal behaki's behaki's work um where it is referred to as sambosa it was in its original form as made in the kitchens samosas were pasties filled with meat and dried fruit and deep fried now this meat could be uh, basically uh, meat that they would have hunted and we don't know when exactly it assumed the current form filled with minced meat or potatoes and peas like the punjabis eat it but we do know that when akbar annexed the malwa sultanate in 1562 the nimmat nama was procured by the mughals and subsequently his kitchen started cooking the samosa and then it became widespread from there so vanita is saying that nothing is indian neither vada nor pav nor chai <laughs> no but vada is vada is dahi vada i would say is because it came uh, it king someshwar da uh, deva who was a part of chalukya dynasty he had that in his kitchen so i would say the dahi vada still is uh, pav is not chai is not uh, potato is not uh, you will know about it a little uh, uh, when we go um, ahead and what about so then the samosa is persian then i would say it came from central asia um so did the paneer so did the jalebi so did the faluda all of it it came through that route into india because we were being ruled by uh, their dynasties for a long time and then we may have adapted and then made it our own and put potatoes and peas and paneer and now we even put noodles in it and shezwan chutney and what not so it's an ever evolving dish i would say uh yeah you're right vanita idli does have indonesian uh, influences some people say that i haven't been able to authenticate that fact uh, but a version of idli is also mentioned in manosulasa so you know how do we kind of put an actual thumbs up on something and say this is the ultimate truth because i think there's learning that constantly is going to keep happening yeah dosa is indian i would say okay next so this is what the nimmat nama when we got the chefs to make it look like um in nimmat nama you are supposed to flavor the samosas with uh, camphor edible camphor it had deer meat it had edible camphor and it also had musk which is basically the the fragrant substance you find inside a deer uh it also was flavored with that we obviously didn't use deer meat we obviously didn't use musk but we used an ittar flavored with musk and all of that to flavor these and had camphor in it. okay moving to the next thing uh traders and conquerors this was my chapter number 4 and you know while everyone will credit vasco da gama for being the first explorer to reach india by sea there has been a steady trade happening in the world since the indus valley time and this is why mesopotamia so mesopotamia was one one civilization in one part of the world and indus was in the other but you know people say vasco da gama started these trade routes and all of that but you know there was definitely trade happening since the indus valley time because coins were found in one part of the one part of the world 
and Mesopotamian coins in Indus Valley and Indus Valley coins in Mesopotamia. So obviously they traded, which is why they had, you know, exchange of coins. Or, uh, or if it was not coins, then certain kinds of, uh, uh, you know, tools or certain kinds of jewelry or something, uh, which means that there was some cross connection. People cross paths even back then. Uh, we have to, however, we have to credit influences coming from the Portuguese, Persian, Dutch, French, and English colonists who changed the way we ate. Now, these influences gave us ingredients like watermelon, tamarind, sag, almond, cumin, coffee, chai, guava, papaya, chiku, paneer, oranges, lychees. I mean, chiku. So much more. Chiku, yeah, even chiku. Um, lychees and so much more, which brings me to the next ingredient, which is the chili. You cannot imagine Indian food without chili, right? But newsflash, not Indian at all, uh, came to India. Um, it existed centuries ago, uh, but it came to India much, much later by the Portuguese who themselves got it from uh, Brazil. So that's how it came to our kitchen. Now, the last chapter which was my conclusion. This brings me to the concluding chapter of my book, what we created with these ingredients once the last colonist, which is British, left India. Pre and post-independence, food choices were influenced by what national leaders ate and championed. For example, Gandhi talks about converting to vegetarianism. His food choices were not just dietary, but also made a political statement like going off sugar and chocolate was linked with him protesting the exploitation of and slave labor and imperialism that was happening on plantations across the world. Gandhi was vegan, went off sugar, practiced fasting, and basically he was quite a millennial in his life choices because you know he was so he was so cool. He, he did everything. He had like uh, non dairy milk, and he didn't eat chocolate because it he didn't think it was appropriate because of the kind of unfair trade practices that were there on these cacao plantations. So uh, supremely ahead of his time, he uh, practiced fasting. He used to go off sugar. He used to go off chai. He used to go off coffee. So he used to go off whatever he thought he could go. He wanted to go off at different points of time. He used to be eggless, though he used to eat everything. Uh, he made a commitment, a promise to his Gujarati mother saying, I will not eat eggs anymore. And uh, he used to cheat and eat sometimes, but he used to feel so guilty that he ultimately gave up on non-vegetarian eggs completely. Uh, while Nehru invested in Moti Mahal in Delhi, uh, the restaurant, he used to be a big fan of their butter chicken. So even invested, you know, his banquets would have the Moti Mahal butter chicken. Uh, Tagore appeared on food ads, including uh, a bone, this bone vita ad. And he wrote copy for Lipton Tea and the next dish that I'm going to be talking about is inspired from Rabindranath Tagore's kitchen, which is the cauliflower barfi. Can you share the recording, Mr. Bitter? Okay, so Champa, we will definitely do that. Uh, yeah, this will be streamed live, so we will be sending the link. Okay. Um, I'm so, Zainab is saying, I'm so like Gandhiji. I went off dairy and unknowingly went vegan. I feel you, Zainab. I am, uh, I am kind of the same. I have this running joke amongst my friends about how my diet is like Gandhi without even aspiring to be like him. It's just by default like him. Um, your last post was also that you're 90% vegan or something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. I can't give up cheese as yet. I haven't mustered the courage to do that. That's my little weak spot. Okay. So, um, cauliflower barfi. Now, cauliflower, so Tagore used to apparently have these food swings, I would say, not mood swings, I would say food swings, because he would have one ingredient or everything used to be made with that ingredient, like cauliflower. Now, everything was made with cauliflower. On his 50th birthday, his niece uh, came up with this particular cauliflower barfi recipe. And uh, this is what it looked like. It is made with cauliflower. Now, if you can have cauliflower pizza right now, then uh, this barfi is also something that you can have, right? It was mushed up cauliflower along with khoya. And I've tried it. It's not disgusting at all. It's quite delicious, actually. But you can eat the only a little bit because after that, you it reminds you of gobi ki sabji. So definitely not recommending that unless you're very experimental. But he had very interesting dishes come up in his uh, kitchen, like Jimmy Kand ki jalebi. Um, like he used to make fish curry without fish because that was made with, I think... Uh, 
रॉ बनाना और रॉ जैक फ्रूट इन सर ऑफ द फिश ओके एंड फाइनली आई एम कमिंग टू इंडियन फूड वेर इट इज टूडे post liberalization india also experienced a change in media ownership so the monopoly of broadcasting shifted from the government to private players it was only in 1992 that zee tv india's first private entertainment channel launched in hindi in the second year itself they launched india's first cookery show which was khana khazana with chef sanjeev kapoor as the face of indian cooking can you guess what are the three words he said can there can anybody guess he said three words super popular even today Hmm. Ananya, show people what did he say? <laughs> namak swad anusar. Popularized this phase, namak swad anusar. See, not a lot of people know this, but actually, for the for this very uh, very show, Khana Khazana, uh, Chef Harpal Sokhi had audition. I don't know if you guys know Harpal Sokhi. He's the guy who does namak shamak. Uh, he has his own show. and he was also one of the he's still one of the most popular uh, badhiya lajawab yaad hai you're right uh, amita he says badhiya lajawab so he basically popularized uh, this phase namak swad anusar and harpal sokhi who was original choice for this show popularized the phrase namak shamak okay a hundred influences later i come to the last dish that i'm going to be talking about today um and as people see this anana can you move the um, to show people the next one this is actually a cauliflower ice cream with candied cauliflower which is uh, you know when i did this experiment with uh, this restaurant called mask in bombay they took the influence of cauliflower from rabindranath and made their own version um and they made this meetha uh, which is a cauliflower ice cream and they served it with a cauliflower candy um what they are trying to say is where and what i'm trying to say is where this is where indian food is today where you take our history and convert it into something else completely and that's where indian food is going towards complete modernization and here's my conclusion this is from my book of what i feel where indian food is today redefining indian cuisine right now are modern indian restaurants like mask indian accent bombay canteen o pedro zia avartana each restaurant here is redefining the generic understanding of indian cuisine and there are a few points that tie them together these restaurants refuse to cow down to preset rules of indian cooking while there is ample respect for roots and recipes no experiment is high risk enough this is not the first time in indian history that diners are at the brink of a colossal shift in their attitude towards cooking but this is definitely that time for my generation and some of those are very very fun and nice restaurants indian accent is one of my favorites <laughs> yeah it is it is one of the most iconic indian restaurant um but that's it that's my presentation guys i dedicate this book to my mom uh who not only uh who not only whose kitchen was my in in ground of inspiration when i started researching um you know this is where my curiosity started from as to why she cooks what she cooks um her lunches have also fueled this project while i took so long to write this book uh cut fruits would magically appear on my writing desk and lunch would appear and everything would appear on my desk just so that i could keep writing so this book is dedicated to my mom so one question before we get into the questions we have lots of them for you is about the ayurvedic diet because that is something that actually comes up quite much when we talk about indian cooking so yeah. tell us a little bit about that and how does ayurveda tie into it so i think uh, you know what my understanding about ayurvedic food is that of course it it stems back to the vedas right um, it is called ayurveda because uh, it came from uh, a vedic text and not only did it tell us uh, you know certain things that we are supposed to eat saying eat this it is seasonal eat that it is seasonal it, it also told us things that were forbidden like you can't eat uh, curdled milk um you know back in the days in ayurveda it talks about if you had to uh, use uh, if you had to curdle milk how you're supposed to use uh, lemon juice to do it different vedas told us different things uh, in in uh, yajur uh, yajur veda in artha veda different vedas gave us different ingredients and that's when even the indian kitchen was evolving through those vedas um ayurvedic texts talk about certain things like uh, colostrum which is cow, you know you make uh, badai today out of uh, uh, a lactating cow's milk that itself comes from 
the ayurvedic text i don't know if you know about this but it's called uh, posu in konkani kharvas in marathi uh, bari in gujarati um, you know those kind of things were also mentioned in ayurveda um and ayurveda places milk as uh, one of the it says that milk is a complete food so those who are vegans i'm very sorry but uh, ayurveda has called uh, milk a complete uh, food so many things we get uh, uh, medicines so many medical things were spoken about in uh, ayurveda um and that's what i feel about it yeah i know because that is has a big influence on the way people eat so i'm going to ask you my first question because this one was very curious so, so one more thing i'll add to kriti um you know um ayurveda basically uh, came into being as mentioned uh, by this great indian physician called uh, uh, shushruta uh, and he wrote something called shushruta samhita and uh, he prepared the foundational text for ayurveda and then everything came out of uh, those in that text all the philosophies that uh, doctors then developed came out of these uh, very primitive books and lata is asking we have such varied styles in india so from north to south from east to west totally different in every state so how did that evolve because like literally i mean it's so different the food in almost all the different states i think a very simple example of that is uh, everybody eats what is local to them uh, and what grows locally depends on the climate that is there for example so for example you are not given uh, certain ingredients in certain part because perhaps your body doesn't need that like ayurvedic text itself classify so when you see ayurveda the text will classify the weather into six different seasons right it will have spring which is vasant ritu then it will have grishma which is summer which, then it is varsha which is monsoon then there is sharad which is autumn hemant which is winter um fall winter actually and then there is shishira which is winter and they talk about food to be had and not had during those period for example during hemant hemant ritu um one was not allowed one could savor uh, sour and salty uh, juicy food because that's what the body apparently needs in certain in rainy season the diet had to be predominantly sour salted and fatty now these are all things mentioned by ayurveda depending on what they thought was uh beneficial for the body during that season so i think our our indian habit of eating seasonally also is rooted back in ayurveda very nice uh, there's a question like uh, that sonal is asking where do you see indian cuisine going in the future what's next i mean we've reached fusion food what's next i think uh, i think there are pl- two two places where i put chefs uh, either there are chefs who are experimenting with indian food and taking it to another level indian restaurants like indian accent mask bombay canteen that i spoke about and then there are people like me uh, who are not talking about experimental dishes but are talking about forgotten regional dishes there is space for both but that is where the future of indian food is going it is not talking about the first layer like i said it's either talking about the next layer or it's talking about the hidden layer all right and amita is asking that uh, especially about the ayurvedic diet there are a couple of questions do we eat according to seasons are we supposed to and zainab says that even in the ayurvedic diet we include metal to detox so i am not an ayurveda expert so i am not very sure if i can comment on uh, metal being something that ayurveda prescribes i think a proper physician will be able to say you know kind of uh, give a thumbs up or thumbs down to that but i will say yes i we sh- we eat um like i said we eat seasonally because that indian habit of eating seasonally comes very much from the ayurvedic texts uh like i said ayurveda this you know has six mentioned six different seasons what to eat in a certain season what to not eat in a certain season all comes from ayurveda Now, one of the questions I'm going to ask you, of course, is the balan. You know, we see it, and we see all our mothers with it. We see everybody running around the husbands with it. So, where did the balan come from? Is it Italian? Not Indian. Indian. No, again, I, I, I news flash. The balan is also not Indian. Um, Indian balan is, you know, you will see it's splittingly similar to the Indian uh, matarello, which is like a big, more uh, fatter version of the um, balan. Indian balan is nice and slender. and uh, it's across across you'll find it from north to south you'll find everybody using the balan um and it didn't originate in uh, in india it came around central italy somewhere between 8 to between 8 to 3rd century now there is a big gap between both these centuries but it came around somewhere there um now indian food is generally associated with the balan 
but what differentiates the indian balan from the uh, italian one is that we also have the rolling board the chakla as we call it that is what separates uh, indian balan from the italian one italian balan is only that mattarello now this one i think this is a a question that we always get why do we eat with our hands and what's the benefit of eating with our hands and this practice because it's going out of style because we are all eating with spoons and it's so much more what would i say uh kosher or fancy <laughs> so you know our habit of eating with our hands is um, one signature trait that we share uh, with it's obviously very indian to eat with your hands but we also share it with certain parts of other parts of asia with africa and the middle east because there are certain cultures there also who eat with their hands um in india again you know our habits of eating our habits of doing the tadka the chhok eating seasonally everything comes back comes goes back to the ayurveda so does eating with your hands um basically it starts with fingers being able to identify um, their multiple benefits one of them is the fingers are able to identify the temperature of the food because you have nerve endings at the end of your uh, finger and then the brain can also begin the digesting process when it senses that there is food at the tips of my finger besides uh, you know ayurveda also says each uh, finger represents a different uh, body uh, element fire earth water air ether all of that and uh, eating with five fingers ensure that all these elements stay balanced and uh, that's why we eat with our hands wow very nice uh, i'm going to ask you this question gulab jamun one of the favorites and we always consider this a very 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 indian dish <laughs> central asian like the jalebi faluda naan samosa that i described comes from central asia uh -huh. and the samosa we've already talked about yeah, and then one... people have to read my book for the samosa answer for the <laughs> yes. samosa answer next one rohit now this the question of the biscuit the biscuit that we have with our tea and so this is a question for all of you what company because a company was specifically created and this is what i found so interesting in your book to meet the indian need for biscuits does anybody know which company this was because i it was intriguing that we actually because i think the biscuits came from the british or where did it come from and that's where true. did it leave that's true it came from the british the chai and the biscuit both came from the british we learned it from them so the hindu biscuit company later came to be known as britannia was created to meet the biscuit needs in india you know a side story which came in much later when the swadeshi movement was gaining momentum parle ji was one of india's most iconic indian biscuits that came about and it was established to counter the popularity of british led brands like britannia united biscuit glaxo those are the early indian biscuit companies and they were created kind of indian swadeshi uh, movement created these indian biscuits to kind of take indians out of the habit of eating those british biscuits with chai and we learned this whole habit of drinking chai also from these mem sahibs who used to drink chai in the afternoon in fact you know it was so sweet that i read one of the things where they would keep their uh, tea things like the little uh, tea strainer and you know those little tea cups and all in their uh, cupboards their fine tea cups and all in their cupboards uh, it was locked up in the cupboards it was like a, like a thing of pride where they would host these tea parties for others and all of that so tea was very much now we don't know when it became this whole milky concoction but uh, the britishers really wanted uh, it was one of the largest uh, it was producing a lot of tea and they wanted indians to get into the habit of drinking tea but what happened is actually it became an emotion it became more than a habit for an indian to we were so possessive about our chai right and uh, uh, people were strategically positioned on indian railways to sell tea uh, mill workers got a break, tea break Where they could go out and drink chai, and then it became a habit, and then that's where the, our emotion about tea comes into being. Uh, yeah. So this one we've already done, Rohit. The next one. So this one, I think all of you are going to get this one right. So which is now the largest selling biscuit brand in the world? So this is how much of an influence now that we've had and loved the biscuit that we actually have the largest selling biscuit brand in the world. I'd love to hear from everybody because I think a lot of you will get this. No, not Britannia. <laughs> Mita and Lata, right? <laughs> it's Parley. It's Parley G. I mean, so that has become like the largest selling. Yeah, apparently, it's even uh, larger. Um, if I'm not mistaken, than Oreo. Um, better selling than Oreo. 
Now, even in the Ramayan, and uh, there's a lot of talk about food, right? And there's a lot of talk about good cooks and women being good cooks. So who were the great cooks in the Ramayan? Sita, she was apparently a good cook. And uh, her uh, cooking uh, abilities reached, uh, praise of her cooking abilities reached all the way to um, Ravan uh, across the waters in Sri Lanka. Um, again, these are all, uh, Sukriti, like these are all, this is all a part of Indian mythology. Uh, one will never be able to authenticate it, but this is what I read in my research that she was known for her uh, cooking uh, abilities. In fact, even today, there's something called Sita Ki Rasoi in Ayod Ayodhya. There's a little spot which they claim that was her kitchen. And, you know, they've kept an ad hoc villain and, uh, you know, the rolling board in a corner. So great. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. If all of you have questions, please do ask. And now I know we also said that we are going to talk about one of the biggest things that we are very time constrained. So how can we make food quicker, faster? Any tips from us? Uh you know, I just, in fact, wrote an article about uh, simmer sauces. I think they've become such a big rage. Uh, they've been around for a while, but suddenly um, during the pandemic, people, a lot more people started cooking at home and simmer sauces gained so much of momentum. So many uh, smaller brands came out making those. Simmer sauces are basically, I wouldn't call them ready to cook because I kind of have a problem with the kind of uh, things that are there in ready to cook packets. But these are artisanal sauces which uh, I have uh, everything that you need to just put in your pan, add some veggies, meats, some greens, and you know, your, your, your stir fry meal is ready. So I think uh, one of the quickest cooking tips I can give you is to stock up your kitchen with tons of simmer sauces, or you can even make them over the weekend and then use them through the week. Um, nowadays, you get everything. I wrote an entire article on 11 uh, simmer sauces that you can find uh, in India and how to use them. That would any be other, nice. Yeah, any other tips for us for quick cooking? Um, I think quick, when you say quick cooking, uh, there are a lot, I think the lesser you cook your food, I think the better, Sukriti, because like even uh, a lot of nutritionists claim that uh, overcooking food is kind of uh, damaging. Uh, yeah, fermentation, Zainab, sorry, I just saw your message. Uh, fermentation is uh, an Indian technique. We used to soak our things overnight and eat them the next day or let rice be soaked in water it would get fermented and then we would eat it the next day water or yogurt so you're right sorry Sukriti I'm coming back to your quick uh, cooking tips so yeah that is one of the other things uh, sourcing uh, pre uh, pre cooking uh, food over the weekend so to ensure that you know you have things to eat through the week um, also the fact that so I have this habit because I like to drink a smoothie every morning uh, you know, there'll be like packets kept in my house in my refrigerator stocked up as Monday Tuesday Wednesday uh, which will have like a combination of one fruit one nut one green uh, one vegetable uh, ziploc uh, pre-chopped ziploc frozen so all I have to do is then blend it and then my morning smoothie is ready. So that's something that I do. And I, I highly recommend it if people don't have time for a wholesome breakfast in the morning to do that. Amar is asking, what about tips for healthy cooking? Okay. Again, I will say uh, from my understanding of food, I am not a nutritionist. So I feel like, you know, to kind of call something healthy, unhealthy would be a little risky as, a, uh, as somebody who hasn't studied nutrition. Uh, but, you know, a, a few things that I picked up from uh, people is uh, to uh, one of the things to do is to when you if you use nuts in your cooking is to pre-soak nuts and discard the water uh, because it has uh, a lot of uh, uh, anti-vitamins that uh, need to be discarded the water soaks it up and it needs to be discarded um, there are other things uh, for example to salt the food once you're done uh, eat, uh, cooking it once the food is completely cooked, you salt your food, you season the food then uh, and not while you are cooking it because the benefit of that salt will be much more. Uh, iodine will be much more if you've cooked it. Uh, another thing that I learned is to always eat uh, cooked tomato because uh, tomato is more nutritious, nutritious when it's cooked rather than when it is eaten raw. So these are little things that I know um, when it comes to eating nutritious food, but Listen, guys, I eat everything. The whole key is to just keep, uh, be moderate and not uh, stick to one diet like Gandhi. Just keep experimenting and you will reach a spot which works the best for you. 
and Kash is asking, is kanji Indian? That's also fermented. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it is Indian. And does rock salt, Suman is asking, have iodine? I am not sure of that. Again, it's a very nutrition-less con co uh, co um, comment. Uh, I think I will leave that to a nutritionist. <laughs> Any other questions that uh, tomato has vitamin C, which is yeah. destroyed with cooking? No, but in fact, I'll tell you the name uh, of the, um, I'll have to research this out for you, but apparently tomato is better cooked, better than when it's uh, cooked. So, but again, you know, there are so many schools of thought when it comes to cooking. Um, uh, vegan doctors will tell you not to drink milk. Ayurveda doctors will tell you it is the complete food. You know, it depends on what is, what you feel is uh, working out for you. And biryani, is it Indian or is it Persian? No, it, it apparently uh, came into uh, being in the Mughal kitchen in India. It was originated in the Mughal kitchen in India. And what about the sambar? A lot of questions about that. Where did the sambar originate from? So sambar actually uh, comes from uh, in the Maratha, uh, the, the sambaji. Uh, came up with the concept of uh, sambar uh, in the Tanjore kingdom because that time Tanjore was ruled by the Marathas. And uh, they used to make amti for him. And one day, uh, one of the Indians uh, was missing. Uh, they used to flavor their food with a certain saring agent. And one day it was missing. So they put tamarind. And uh, it turned into sambar. So actually, uh, the South Indian sambar is actually a gift of the Marathas. Oh, very interesting. Suman is asking some healthy snack options. Hummus and uh, vegetables. That's what I like to eat. Excellent, excellent. Uh, any other questions? If anybody would like to ask, please also raise your hand. I can unmute you. Otherwise, any closing thoughts that you have, Sonal, now that you've gone through so much history and understanding about Indian food? I'm just, uh, you know, while you were, uh, I just came uh, through this. I just want to quickly uh, take the tomato question. Sure. Uh, tomato apparently releases more uh, lycopene, which is a cancer fighting antioxidant when it is cooked, which is why I said that I read this somewhere. The tomato is much better when it's cooked. A lot of ingredients uh, work better when they are cooked and some ingredients work well when they are raw. So it just depends. I think a lot of study needs to be done before we commit some thought. Um, to see how it is affecting us, to see why it is benefit beneficial for us. Um, and then kind of, like, for example, I recently read somewhere in some research that people who have uh, who are uh, blood type A positive, uh, Thai food is not good for them. It was so shocking, um, you know, to read that. But again, I would say that these things are so, so uh, important to check with a medical practitioner then kind of claim to, you know, then people who don't have a medical degree to say that, okay, eat this or don't eat that. Um, because I think uh, people who study nutrition know these things much better. So it's like Zainab has said, you are the Google of food origination. So that I am, that I will take, but not of nutrition. <laughs> but what I'd like to understand is how has your style changed in what you're eating or what you are now making in terms of recipes after writing this book? Um, uh, definitely I started eating barley. I never used to eat that much barley, but I read in these uh, books that barley was uh, one of the first Indian grains. I understood that it was something that my ancestors have been eating. I better start paying attention to it. And uh, I incorporated it in my meal. So I eat a lot of barley salad. I eat a lot of barley porridge. Um, I eat a lot of barley in general now. Uh, and that happened to me after I started writing the book. And what about the other millets? Are they also from India? Because barley. Lord, is like yeah, yeah, yeah. India is a uh, is uh, what do you say a hotbed for millets. We used to eat a lot of millets before rice and wheat uh, became popular. So a lot of Indian uh, millets are Indian, predom originating in India. And Amar is asking any thoughts on northeastern food cuisine. Such little is known. I'm so curious about it. I want to travel to the region. I want to know more about it. I want to learn so much about Northeastern food. Um, I What I understand of it is um, all the various regions, all the uh, states in Northeast uh, India have very distinctive cuisines of their own. They are as distinct as a Gujarati food would be different from a Malayali food. And uh, it this needs a lot of deep study. Um, I think it's one of definitely one of my uh, next projects is to explore 
uh, northeastern cuisine and understand it as indian cuisine um it's very tribal led uh, there are lots of tribes for example in nagaland it will have so many different tribes and tribal kingdoms and food that came out of it but the but the, but the interesting part is um, in a in a region like uh, say rajasthan um food that the royals ate and the food that the locals ate will be very very different but in regions like orissa or northeast india uh, the tribal kingdom food and the food that the locals would eat would be slightly similar slightly because there was only that much available everything was very reliant on the flora and fauna of that region now my last question before i i ask you for your concluding remarks now you made all these dishes what did they taste like because we are not able to taste them so when you made these dishes from all these different eras what was the taste like uh, talk us through that i think uh, it was very uh, rustic it did not until the royal royal cooking came into being uh, indian food was very rustic it was not uh, it was not refined the avhat kitchens the mughal kitchens they refined indian food they made it like uh, much more nuanced uh before that uh, obviously we were very ahead of our time for example like i said nala talking about edible garnishes and all of that uh, you don't know what ingredients were there at that time and what they taste like we can only kind of do interpretations so the food that we tried to make was very very rustic for example that samosa which has camphor actually tasted like you were eating wicks you know because it had that camphor such strong camphor flavor but then i heard that even today in kerala like basundi has camphor they put edible camphor in basundi it's an amazing diversity amar is saying in indian cuisine i think yeah. Yeah. but my question is i think amazing diversity now in the cuisine of the world because we have taken a little bit from everywhere yeah so any closing thoughts that you have as we end for today um i think that uh, everything that the book says uh firstly you should buy the book it's called who samosa is it anyway uh it's published by penguin india and it's about the history of uh, indian food and where it came from and it's written in a very fun way i've tried to not keep it too pedantic and keep it too serious i've tried to make uh, jokes i've tried to kind of make it very contemporary um so if you happen to read it please take that book as a starting point to a lot more thinking uh, i don't need anybody to take my truth as the truth this is my research this is my truth this is how i understood indian food but this can be taken and completely questioned and you know um, built upon last question i think by lata the spices how did spices get so incorporated in indian food it was always there indian food we we a lot of spices like uh, pepper uh, so basically indian uh, subcontinent grew a lot of spices indonesia grew a lot of spices and um, we had a lot of access to spices and so we were always cooking with it like even the like even the uh, olden recipes that we saw it had uh, tons of spices going into it especially pepper like pepper was one of the most most expensive uh, of uh, indian spices and um, actually that talks about uh, the importance of spices like i said everything that we uh, you know incorporated in our meals was something that uh, ayurveda told us to do fantastic and zena where can you buy it's available on amazon very easy to buy you can just buy it from there and a lot of people yes you can connect with sonal on uh, instagram she is very much there it's very easy to find so please do connect and thank you sonal i mean i think now we're all hungry and are going to look for samosas and other foods that are going to really tempt our tummies now so with that i thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us thank you this was incredible i had fun doing my first ever live session so thank you for this opportunity Thank you. Thank you and good night everyone. And Amar says amazing session. Lata the food was so exotic. And Champa lovely chat. Look forward to the recording. Thank you guys. Have a great evening. You too.